Hello, you're listening to the second episode of the Russian Context Podcast, in which we want to put Russia in context again. This podcast is brought to you by the Nova Gazeta, one of the few independent newspapers left in Russia. Here, we speak about the most significant texts on everything important happening in Russia today. Please support independent Russian media and follow us on whatever platform you hear this. Your likes are very welcome. My name is Denis Nikulin. Today we discuss education in Russia. In five chapters we will find out how Russian conservatism suffers from modern universities with foreign diplomas and free-thinking students, along with science in general, and science of history in particular. Introduction Lately, Russian conservatism causes plenty of problems to the university with liberal professorship. Rector of the Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences was to be put in jail, and the higher school of economics suffered from mass dismissal of oppositional professors, which led to rector's discharge. In addition, the government can't help itself from attacking history and all scientific community in general. What are the circumstances for Russian higher education and science? And will there be any non-pro-governmental university or non-pro-governmental science? Chapter 1. In which the rector is under a home arrest. Shaninka, as we call Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences, provides dual degree, British participation and education which is based on European values. It was established in the 90s by Tudor Shanin, a famous sociologist who worked as a professor in the UK. Shaninka is one of the few independent educational bodies in Russia. Its rector, Sergei Zuev, was arrested on the 11th of October. The police took Zuev right from the hospital where he had been curing from high blood pressure. He is accused of embezzling 21 million rubles, which is about $300,000, because the university signed a contract with the government, and the accusation says the contract was violated. Zuev denies his guilt and claims that the job the university made under the contract was absolutely lawful and conscientious. Due to his bad health, he stayed under home arrest, but on the 19th of October, the prosecutor asked the court to change Mr. Zuev's preventive measure and put him in a detention center instead of keeping him under home arrest. The next day, Zuev was hospitalized with hypotonic crisis. The students and the professors of Shaninka wrote a public letter and it has been signed by 400 scientific community members. This letter says, Bearing in mind multiple cases of pressure on the best humanitarian Russian universities and faculties, we have every right to consider the Shaninka's case as a serious threat to institutional and academic autonomy. Right after the arrest of Mr. Zuev, an inspection came to the Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. Its rector, Vladimir Mao, comes from system liberals, and some people say that Mr. Mao is under risk of being arrested as well. We talked to Grigory Yudin, a professor in Shaninka. Grigory, you've posted a quite emotional text on Facebook considering this exact situation with Mr. Zuev. What excites you so much? Well, uh, of course, I'm personally involved in this situation. Uh, I'm a professor at the Moscow School of Social and Economic Sciences, where Sergei Zuev has been the rector for the last uh, 10 years and he's done a tremendous job at the university. Uh, his uh, close colleague, friend, someone who contributed a lot to the development of the university, to the prosperity of the university. Uh, so I'm, I'm personally involved, but even besides that, uh, even putting this aside, uh, I think the very fact that someone uh, who works as a director at the university uh, it becomes the object of very strange persecution. Uh, and given his health, it can be literally legal for for him. Uh, all the things that have been happening uh, with uh, been happening to 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 uh, the last three or four weeks is just frightening. I mean, he's been uh, taken to surgery uh, just a few weeks ago. And even that doesn't uh, stop the prosecutor's office from uh, insisting on putting him behind the bars. Uh, even though 
he cooperates with the investigators. He doesn't intend to to hide. And that all sounds just surreal. Uh, So on both levels, the personal level and the level of the attack on the rector of one of the established universities, I think it is... It's just terrifying. We know that right now you're near the court building where the jury considers the prosecutor's appeal on putting Mr. Zurif in a detention center. What is going on there? What is the atmosphere? What are your expectations? And what do people around say? Well, right now, I think uh, there is, yeah, there is actually a court hearing. And we don't know much about what's going on inside uh, because people are not let in. Uh, people are not let in, uh, even into the building uh, of the court, let alone uh, the, the courtroom. Uh, so actually, uh, there's a lot of people uh, crowding near the, uh, the court building uh, and waiting for uh, any news uh, from the court. And that's all uh, Kafka is. It reminds you of Kafka's novels. When, there's, uh, when you have no news, no access, no information, and you keep guessing on some very remote uh, signs about what is going on uh, inside, what the decision could, uh, could be. I just don't want to be part of this uh, guessing procedure. So I don't think there's anyone here who could tell you more about what's going on uh, inside the court right now. What should Shaninka expect thereafter? Will it dwell without Mr. Zuev and who's next? We don't know. Uh, I have no idea. When you're asking who, who's next in line, uh, you are assuming that there is some specific logic. I don't, I'm not sure I, I'm aware of this, of this logic. I'm not sure I understand what exactly is, is going on uh, right now. Uh, and uh, therefore, I cannot speculate on <laughs> who could be next in line. Obviously, what we are witnessing is, a, is an, a, an attempt, a desperate attempt uh, of the secret services, uh, of the so-called Siloviki in, in Russia, to, to get entrenched. And they are looking for new and new victims. Sometimes they cooperate with uh, other Uh, interests uh, groups uh, in the elites and the work to put more and more people behind behind the bars because it's they, they think that it helps them to hold their positions. So in that respect, I would of course uh, expect more victims uh, to come. As for the university, uh, first of all, uh, we are not giving up obviously as Gezu. Uh, we, are, uh, we are doing a lot to prove that uh, he's first innocent and then uh, he doesn't deserve that kind of brutal treatment. He's a respected man, uh, he's a scholar, he did a lot to the Russian education and that alone should be enough uh, to, to deserve a very different kind of treatment. To be with, has inherited the university from Theodor Schein and Theodore uh, was the one who established the university, who institutionalized it in the Russian education system, and the one who actually believed, strongly believed, in the power of communities, not the personalities, but mm-hmm. communities. And therefore, he was constantly building Shaninka and strengthening Shaninka as a community. Uh, and Shining is actually its mission uh, is to large extent to, to build and to expand the communities. Thank you, Grigori, for your comment. After this interview, the court has satisfied the prosecutor's appeal and Sergei Zuev was transferred into a detention center without giving him an opportunity to take his thanks. Chapter 2, in which a loyal rector replaces a non-loyal one. The High School of Economics is a university known as an oasis of liberalism for a long time. In 2019, all oppositional professors were fired right in the beginning of a school year, in one day, with no opportunity for the fired to find a job. The official reason? Reorganization. The version no one believes. The former professors started the Free University, an independent educational project free from censorship, international, online and free of charge. The founders say that they don't want to integrate their project into a Russian educational system. 
The new course of the HSE was confirmed after the rector's replacement. The founder, Yaroslav Kuzminov, left his seat, which was almost without any clear reason taken by Nikita Anisimov. Mr. Anisimov made his career as a man of office. Young and loyal technocrat, came from a conservative Moscow university, always followed the instructions given him from the above. Mr. Kuzminov, on the other hand, is a reformer who made this university famous for its values and high level of education. However, not only the top management of universities is being attacked. One of the best examples is DOXA, a student journal in the High School of Economics, a small media project, the office of which was broken by the police on the 19th of April. The police arrested four editors and now they have been staying under home arrest for about six months. The formal reason to open the case is a video where the guys spoke on pressure from the university administrations, restricting them to go on a protest, threatening to send the guys down. We talked to Dmitry Dubrovsky, an associate professor in the HSE in St. Petersburg. Please tell us why universities and students are in danger. Uh, well, I... I <laughs> I would be very, uh, very careful to identify the, the, the direct threat from the, uh, from the university, from the, from the students, from the academics, from the government. Because that is always the very difficult question. What is the roots? What is the, uh, the real threats for the academics, for the students, for the lecturers in Russian universities? The most of the threats, most of the uh, situations we are dealt with and we are dealing with when it comes to the violation of academic rights and freedoms in Russia, uh, this is always uncertain whether this particular situation is because of the political activity of the students or lecturers, or it's because of the particular students or lecturers somehow, you know, challenged their authority, somehow contradicted the publicly the authority. And that is, it could be the, the authority of the different level. And I would not uh, identify the main dangers from the government. So the substantial amount of the cases, what we do see, we do see that there's a serious uh, problem from the uh, university authority. So, and this is the one of the serious issues because for the most of the cases, when we are facing the, the student's expulsion or the lecturers might lose the job, That is because of the different manipulation with the administrative law and administrative procedure. And that is why the most of the cases is very difficult to prove and very difficult to bring evidence for the uh, for political motivation of these, uh, of these events, of these actions. My own story, when I was expelled, when, when, I, when I lost my job in there, my, I lost my contract, with the St. Petersburg State University. There's the good proof of this because officially I lost my contract because of the, you know, the kind of disagreement from my side to sign their new contract. Of course, that's where nobody interested to, to dive into details and to investigate my long story of the contradictions and struggle with the rector Kropachev or the just, you know, the number of the unlawful adjustments there. Um, the university, St. Petersburg University Authority inter uh, uh, interested to uh, put into their work, working agreement, agreement including their direct ban for their employees to criticize the university and the Russian government in general without the direct permission of the rector. That could be there in a lot of details, but on the surface, it looks like, you know, just, oh, that case, so one employee didn't sign the agreement, that's fine. So this is the very regular a relationship between the employee and employers. And that is, that is the one, one biggest one issue to identify because in country with, let's say, Belarus, where the, most of the struggles, uh, they are visibly political. That is the, normally looks like the direct revenge of the political authoritarian regime to the, to the lecturers, to the faculty members, to the students who are officially protested, who are protesting against the authoritarian regime. In Russia, these academic rights and freedoms violation that's based on the normally on the interpersonal relationship, in the relationship between the particular faculty members or the particular students and the authority. And it could be very difficult mixed of the different reasons or the different context uh, where these uh, academic rights violation happen. And this is second. And third, Of course, we do have a number of politically motivated persecutions. 
And that is mostly started to after the conservative turn that Russia is living now within, started with uh, 2011 to 12, after the protest against the falsification of election, after the, uh, after the Crimean annexation especially, the conservative turn of the Russian policy, both inside the country and outside the country, uh, of course, had been affected the, the policy to the, to the university and to their students, to the faculty members and so forth. Sometimes, I believe, so-called neoliberal reforms could be easily and successfully combined with the political repressions. Uh, the good example would be higher school of economics when they are the substantial amount of the my uh, colleagues from the higher school of economics they lost their job they 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 even the whole chair had been exterminated I mean constitutional law chair had been exterminated on the alleged uh, expl- alleged reason so there is no need to constitutional law study in the higher school of economics and uh, everybody knew and it, so it was absolutely clear that was the cl- uh, direct revenge for the number of the uh, comments and uh, official statements that faculty members issued about the situation around and uh, with the so-called amendments to Russian constitution. Will there be a chance to study in a university which is independent from the government and its course? Well, I'd say that is the... Um, the because the Russia has the kind of so-called hybrid political issue, This hybrid political authoritarian regime, precisely, uh, it has the kind of certain um, ghetto for the intellectuals, for the liberals. And this is the ghetto from, the, let's say, in the mass media, the echo of Moscow, let's say. And the same ghetto for the, the intellectuals is the European University at St. Petersburg or Higher School of Economics, still, or the Shining. I mean, the Moscow Higher School of Social Economical Studies. But... What we are currently witnessing there, uh, the serious attack or the number of attempts to decrease the level of its independence and to, uh, to interference into the, their autonomy. The current case of the of the Sergei Zuev as director of the of the, this uh, Shining School, named of Theodor Shining, as a creator of this school, and uh, then two attempt attempts to to close the European University down into the several years. Well, let's say 10 years, but still. And this is the sign how the, the Russian political elite try to diminish at least their activity and try to decrease the uh, level of uh, independence of these education bodies to shut them down, let's say. That is my, my, my let's say, scenario for the uh, Moscow Higher School of um, uh, Social and Economical Studies. So uh, that's it would be the attempt to organize the raging uh, raiders attack to them. So that's, I'm afraid, the authority will be substituted. And, and that could be the, not the end, but the, that's, this could lead to the serious transformation of this school, I'm afraid. So that is maybe the main task of those who are attacking the Shining. But at the same time, at the same time, what we do have right now, we have a kind of so-called pocket of effectiveness. So this is the theory of the uh, authoritarian modernization. And instead of these independent bodies, the state started to create the dependent bodies, which allegedly should be kind of the engine for the uh, modernization of higher education, like a two-man school of the uh, school of advanced studies, let's see. It's SAS. And it's interesting because they are, uh, the what authoritarian regime do, uh, it starts uh, for the one side to, to punish uh, those who are independent, but at the same time to create a more dependent, let's say, modernized body of the higher education without academic freedom. I'm not quite, well, I cannot say that we will see the, the closure of the old independent bodies. No, I, I hope not. But the tendency is quite clear. I believe that is about the creation, the alternative forms of the let's uh, let's let's call them pocket of effectiveness uh, in the Russian higher education, and all this pocket of effectiveness there should demonstrate the alternative way of modernization. So there's not a modernization of Western style, but this it should be a modernization of China China style. I would say. It comes to me that such actions from the government don't lead to an absence of oppositional views, but lead to turning down their volume, don't they? 
Yeah, that's is, this is partly true. So this, the main idea is just to close these independent voices down within the academia. This is uh, the, the, recent, the recent investigation we have organized in the Center of Independent Social Research. I am affiliated with as a research fellow. We have a kind of outcome of this research is that the, the substantial amount of the Russian scholars and lecturers, they are agree to concentrate, well, to, to stop, to, to make the public uh, comments or especially public criticism to the, what's going on in the society, in the state, in the international relations, especially in, pol- in politics, to be protected from their unwanted, you know, repercussions. Mm-hmm. Because that is that is the the most of the most of the negative attitudes and pressure the you know, uh, the current Russian university might have. That's about the public activity of its fellows. We thank Dmitry Dubrovsky for his comment. Chapter three, in which all the scientific community suffers. Last January, the Russian parliament accepted amendments to the law about education. Now, if you want to give a public lecture you must get an agreement from the Ministry of Education. Also, universities won't be able to make international partnerships without an agreement from federal administrations. This leads to the end of international integration of Russian science and education. But that being said, even though the law takes place legally, in real life there is still no cases of its use. Now we talk to Mikhail Gelfand, a biologist and a member of Academia Europea. Mikhail, What harm can this law about education make? Well, it has nothing to do with education, to start with. These amendments are in the law on education, but they are actually unrelated to that. They are about popular science and things like that. Uh, so I don't, I don't see any immediate harm to education. As for popular or citizen science projects, it's very nonspecific. And it's non-specific by design. It covers like everything. Lectures, like circles in schools, summer schools or winter schools for high school students or just students or anybody. And the point is that and nobody would enforce the law on everybody. It's clear that it will be... On the other hand, it's impossible not to break this law because, as I've said, it covers everything. So what I expect uh, is cherry picking that people who are who, who have displeased whomever I don't know who would be implementing that they will be targeted and this is exactly what we uh, what we are observing now with the law on foreign agents again it applies to almost everybody it doesn't mean that everybody is prosecuted but it's a very good tool to prosecute whomever you want to prosecute that's one thing that's one thing The other thing is that uh, local administrators, not in capitals, not in Moscow, St. Petersburg, but in smaller cities, they would stop interacting with people or arranging uh, popular science events simply to avoid whatever problems that might entail. So I expect that uh, smaller science festivals, lecture courses, whatever, in smaller cities outside of capitals would die simply because they will find no place to hold these events. Because libraries, schools, or universities would be wary of hosting anything. And yes, I expect that uh, there is the third thing, which is that local security officers who have their own plans and KPIs get a very easy target to uphold, to, 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 to follow these uh, KPI, uh, KPIs. So I also expect that, again, in smaller cities, people will be targeted simply to fill the quota. Thank you, Mikhail, for your comment. Chapter 4, in which scientists become betrayers of the nation. Lately, popular and talented scientists are being claimed betrayers more often since they communicate with foreign partners, go to seminars and conferences. Mostly cases against scientists are bind with hypersonic developments and aerodynamics of flying machines. Alexei Kuranov was engineering hypersonic system, Anatoly Gubanov high-speed flying machines, 
Victor Kudrovtsev is a scientist in Central Engineering Institute, Roscosmos's head scientific organization. A law about betrayal of the nation is very convenient. An investigation is confident. You can't just acknowledge the evidences, plus the sanction is up to 20 years of prison. By the way, not only scientists are charged. Ivan Safronov, a former journalist from the Commissar newspaper and today's counselor of the Roscosmos's head, is blamed for dissemination about military cooperation in Russia in Africa, Middle East and Syria. Mr. Safranov's lawyer says everything that considers to be a betrayal is just his journalistic work. Ivan denies his guilt. We talked to Kirill Martinov, our politics editor. Kirill, why people of humanitarian sciences are just get fired, along with technologists being imprisoned for many years? Here we have an obvious paradox, which is based on the fact that any authoritarian regime is interested in an equipped army. Sometimes, for instance, you have to develop vaccines during pandemics, and due to these necessities, every dictator needs scientists who deal with engineering and other technical tasks. These scientists wait in gold, and without them, Russian army or Russian medicine will turn into dust at a glance. At the same time, humanitarians don't value that much in this case. They are of no good for the dictatorship. They seem to be easily replaced by propaganda. In the Russian educational system, including this in Moscow schools, we have a remarkable situation when a person performs at propagandistic shows on central TV channels, retells his thesis on informational war with the West, calls himself a political scientist, has an academic degree, and the next day he comes in the lecture hall and repeats just the same words he said a day before on TV. That's what we call contemporary socio-political knowledge. And there is no problem about it. The state will easily make it without us. Surely, such a state without social science can't acknowledge the society it has control upon. But on a short distance, there is simply no need in such information for an authoritarian government. It despises such knowledge. And in this regard, the cruelty towards technical scientists is caused by the fact that their work is used by various specific departments, Federal Security Service, for instance, and they think that scientists should keep their knowledge in Russia only and should speak to foreign partners only with someone from force departments behind their shoulders. Somewhat different scenario considers as violation of Russian sovereignty. They irresponsibly bring data about our beautiful little bombs, missiles and secret weapons on international science conferences. Humanitarians don't whistleblow about bombs. And that's why they can be simply fired, even though some our colleagues are under investigation or under a risk of one. So, these years brought us a very remarkable event. Russia celebrated the 100th birthday of Mr. Sakharov, the first Russian Nobel Peace Prize winner, a famous physics scientist who in the 70s turned into a human rights activist in the USSR. And on the official event, which took place at a big concert hall in Moscow, the head of Russian Science Academy read out loud Putin's letter, where were many eulogistic words towards Sakharov, thanking him for developing an H-bomb. We appreciate it. And there was no word saying that Sakharov had any other harmful ideas about ethical values and human rights being defended on the same level where your technologies are. For Russian authorities, it's a blind spot. They just don't think about it. Thank you, Kirill. Chapter 5, in which the state defines the truth in historical science. Former Minister of Culture Vladimir Medinsky now is the head of a new Commission on Historic Education, which is to defend official Russian past from troublesome doubts. In particular, from foreign structures which harm national interests in historic sphere and sophisticates history. Among the members of this commission, we can find such departments as the Federal Security Service, Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Investigative Committee, the General Prosecutor's Office and more force departments. It comes to be that now, history as a science is under control of a force authority and the government. In Russia, we have a story about the 28 Pamphilovtsi, which is about soldiers who defended Moscow in 1941. Historic science community declare that this story is fictional, a myth. But here's what Mr. Medinsky says about it. I deeply believe that even if this story was made up from the start to the finish, even if there was no Pamphilov, even if there was nothing at all, this legend is sacred and untouchable, and people who violate it as comes of the earth. A whole new stratum of things forbidden to discuss is being made. 
Especially when we talk about the first half of the First World War, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and diminishing the official role of the Soviet Union in the World War II. So today it is dangerous to make an honest research on history in modern Russia, because you never know what results of your research may be claimed fake by the Commission. Now we talk to a historian, Ivan Kurilo. Ivan, how and why does today's Russian politics affect our history? What cases can you remember? First of all, this is more or less universal change uh, in the political use of history is spreading across the globe. Certainly, I would uh, focus on the Russian uh, problems, but uh, we all know, we all witnessed it, we all saw what was going on last year in the United States and how the Eastern Central Europe is also engaged in the so-called history wars. So that is not a particular Russian Uh, situation. What uh, makes Russian situation different from the above mentioned uh, is, uh, I would say, overuse of the state tools, of the state coercive power to uh, establish some type of historical canon or to <clears throat> marginalize certain visions of the past uh, in the Russian society. We know that During the last few years, uh, it all started with uh, in 2014 when the first uh, law on so-called rehabilitation of Nazism was introduced into Russian criminal code. And that was the first law which uh, restricted uh, people, not only professional historians, everybody restricted from uh, doing some Uh, things with the past, with the, with the memory of the Second World War. And uh, I would say that it was not about, not only about rehabilitation of Nazism, because it included uh, some criminal offense, such things as uh, the use of the symbols of the Russian military glory in appropriate, in inappropriate way or something like that, which was definitely not a rehabilitation of Nazism per se. Last year, we got an amendment to the Russian constitution, which now ascribed to Russian state uh, the task to defend the historical truth. And since that, we've seen how the coercive uh, power of the state use more and more often Uh, in uh, creating some historical canon. We know that the investigative committee of the Russian Federation since last fall announced several initiatives uh, in the sphere of historical uh, historical politics, I would say, in the historical uh, research event. And that is a, quite a scary thing for Russian historians, first of all. And it's a, a thing which I cannot call dif uh, any other way than the restrictions of the freedom of speech. We uh, recently got a new amendment to Russian leg legislature that uh, also prohibited the comparisons between uh, Soviet Union and the Nazi Germany. So we, we, we get increasing number of restricted topics. Most of those restrict restrictions uh, comes uh, about the Second World War, about the role of the uh, Soviet Union in the Second World War, and about the possibility of comparison of the Soviet and Nazi regimes. That is the main, uh, I would say, uh, defensive line of, of, of the state in Russia. But we see how it's uh, starting to spread outside of the history of the war. We've uh, read news uh, earlier this summer uh, about the you know, investigative committee interrogating uh, like a uh, provincial teacher for comparison of uh, Alexander Nevsky to General Vlasov. And that was already considered something wrong, uh, you know. Uh, I would say that uh, even uh, if I would not defend uh, any thing which is uh, now criminally uh, offensive for the Russian state, uh, well, it's maybe stupid to compare Vlasov to, to Nevsky. It's maybe not uh, just to compare Stalin to Hitler. But uh, state restrictions of everything like that uh, makes the whole research impossible or made it very much uh, complicated because uh, without freedom of thinking, without freedom of comparison, whatever you, you, you choose to, to whatever uh, is important, uh, you uh, lose your research capability if you're a historian. You lose your freedoms if you're just a citizen and want to make a political statement. And that is why I do not like what is going on there. Thank you, Ivan, for your comment. Conclusion. I believe these processes aren't spontaneous. They show that Russian society and Russian autocracy degraded so much that 
forward continuation of today's political regime in Russia is impossible without affecting contemporary educational system. Two years ago, Yegor Zhukov became the first political prisoner in the higher school of economics. He was learning political science and demanded democracy and European values for beautiful future Russia. And for a short time he stayed in prison for that, and then he got a criminal charge. By his case and cases of other decent Russian alumni, we can see that people who take attempts to make modern Russian education free and Europe-like become so-called regime's enemies. Not because they aren't patriots, not because they want to harm their motherland, but because everything Russian authority desires is to keep their seats, to save their status quo, change nothing, and conserve the country for the longest time possible. And people who get modern education automatically become opponents for this state. In order to survive, the Kremlin is ready to get rid of modern education, or at least get rid of social science. Maybe some engineering education will survive, but only to provide the Russian army with weapons. And that's it. This was the Russian Context Podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we would also appreciate your feedback on our email what's new at novagazeta.ru. My name is Denis Nikolin and I thank my producer Nadezhda Jurova and the editor Kirill Martinov. Thank you for listening. Till next time.